All right, folks, I'll talk about the patch notes. If you're not already aware, there's a huge patch coming with a ton of changes here that we'll get to in a minute. Um, some folks have already started putting out videos, uh, advertising the changes, analyzing the changes. Um, Zeno and Murphy in particular have some great videos already going over everything line by line. And so I'm not going to claim that I have a whole lot more to add to the conversation. I'm only making this video so people will stop asking me about it. All right, for starters here, I'm on the Bellatro Discord. And so there is a beta version. There's a playtest version. So before the patch goes live for everybody, you can try it out right now if you want. All you got to do is go to the uh, go to your Steam library, find Bellatro, and then go to Properties, Betas, and then select the Public Experimental from the Beta menu. All right, we've already got here, you know, 3,600, 3,700 messages, uh, people trying it out and then giving their feedback. And so don't expect it to be exactly this. There could be some more bug fixes and there could be some additional changes, you know, potentially minor changes. It'll be mostly this, um, at least in spirit. And so, okay, the first thing that we have, we have a toggle for the reduced motion. And so we already have uh, this kind of, screen shake option in the menu you know if you turn it up then every time you click on something every time you like submit a hand or something like that this you can get the screen to shake quite violently also it has this parallax effect where the screen kind of tilts and follows your mouse around uh, for me personally um, i find that sickening <laughs> uh, it you know gives me a little bit of motion sickness um, i think my my other friends who play the game as well said the same thing and so okay you can toggle that down you can turn down that screen shake effect um, but we also have these other kind of things like uh, the cards kind of wobble and gyrate we have the background is kind of swirly and that can be sickening to some folks as well and so you know not a problem for me personally but i think it's really cool that we have this change you know this, this accessibility change for other people so that's great. You can turn off the swirly background if that's something that uh, was bothering you before. Uh, next here, you know, a maybe a little bit harder to parse here. So the idea is if you didn't already know, you know, let's say you have one of every Joker card. You managed to get a negative copy of every Joker card and you know that uh, you're not able to get duplicates, right? And so you're shopping around and instead of giving you duplicates, well, what does the game give you, right? So it has this protection that prevents the duplicates. Well, to prevent the game from stalling, if you have one of every Joker card, it will give you Jimbo. It'll give you uh, the sort of basic Joker as like the default option. And so like you can reroll the shop and it'll show up like two Jimbos or something like that. Um, there is uh, sort of this same kind of like fallback option for all consumables as well and so for um, planet cards the fallback is pluto and so what that looks like is you know even without percao that gives you like the negative consumables let's say you have the crystal ball and you have three different planet cards and let's say you have the overstock plus voucher that gives you four different planet cards in the shop and so already you have seven planet cards now, if you open just a regular Celestial pack, you know, not even a Jumbo Celestial pack, just a regular Celestial pack, the first two cards will be, you know, whatever planet cards you're missing, and that takes you up to nine total planet cards. And then the last one, okay, we ran out of planet cards, so we'll give you Pluto instead. If you open up a Jumbo pack, it'll just have a bunch of Plutos in it. That's the default for the planet cards. For Tarot cards, the default currently is Fool, and then it's going to change to strength. All right, if you want to know, you know, kind of like why this is, you know, why is this relevant? Why is this changing? You know, what are the implications of this? What are the impacts of this? I do have a video um, coming out probably later today that goes into goes into more depth with that. So, you know, most of the time this is not going to affect you at all. So you could just forget about it. All right, next we've got... Uh, for gold stakes now, some folks are interested in this, um, you know, completionist plus. Uh, sorry, I'm, you know, I'm still trying to figure out the framing here. And so it got cut off a little bit there. But the completionist plus, 
that's the achievement where you're trying to get the gold stickers on all of your jokers and so it's kind of tough to get the gold stickers on the legendary jokers so you know if you want to do this and i have and the way that i've done this is you just sort of just restart just keep restarting until the first shop has a legendary joker every arcana pack that you open has about a one percent chance to have a legendary in it a um, little bit lower chance for spectral packs just because they're smaller they have fewer cards but okay for an arcana pack has about a one percent chance to give you a legendary and then there's five different legendaries so after doing all of these re-rolls all of these restarts uh, once you get a legendary is it the one that you actually need um, or are you gonna have to re-roll another hundred times you know one in 500 chance for you to get the one that you're missing and so the change is now when you're playing on gold stake if there would be a legendary there's no guarantee that the soul is going to come up on that seed but if there is one on that seed then it guarantees to give you uh, a legendary joker that you don't already have the gold sticker on this only applies to gold stakes so this doesn't change the you know rng for any of the lower stakes it's just on the gold stakes if you're trying to go for the gold sticker um it'll give you whatever the legendary that you're missing is and so it's going to be that much easier to get the gold stickers i think that's a great change all right next we've got uh some changes to the anti-scaling here um so mostly it's the i'm going to call them low antis and so it's not anti one but it's sort of anti three and anti four the numbers go down anti two through four the numbers go down again anti two through five the numbers go down this is um across all stakes here white stake green stake and purple stake just generally speaking numbers go down okay that makes the scoring thresholds smaller that makes the game easier right so here's why though so i've kind of said this in the past you know on a white stake here the anti-scaling it's 300 for anti one it's 800 for anti two and then anti three jumps from 800 to 2800 right you know more than three times from anti two to anti three and for me like that's a huge jump and so when people say oh man you know the game is kind of tough you're right the game is kind of tough and this is a, this is why and so you know maybe what happens is you don't actually lose the run until like anti five or six or whatever but there was something earlier in the run which kind of destabilized you and then set you on a losing path. And this is it, right? You know, you can survive the first couple rounds with no jokers or just one joker or something like that. But if you don't have, you know, a lot of material online by anti three in order to hit this 2800, now you're playing two hands in order to win or you're playing three hands in order to win uh in anti four you know maybe it takes you three hands in order to hit six thousand and so you're playing extra hands it's costing you extra money it's snowballing out of control it's setting you on a losing path even if you don't lose right away you're on that path towards losing and so you know lowering the anti three requirements lowering the anti four requirements that's going to just make it easier for you to you know stabilize your early game stabilize your mid game and start saving your money for your end game and so we've got i don't know the numbers are whatever uh you know 3200 to 2400 9000 to 7000 you know what does that mean uh it's less all you got to know is it's less all you got to know is it's easier great all right now we've got uh some changes to the uh higher stakes here and so you know first let's let's talk about orange stake you know what's wrong with the current orange stake what's wrong with the increasing booster pack costs right so we said you know it's really tough to buy booster packs in the early game because you need to be saving your money for interest right you need to be building up your economy and so okay let's not buy any booster packs early and then if we got the increasing booster pack costs well now you know we're talking about ten dollar booster packs fourteen dollar booster packs now i can't buy booster packs later on in the game you know on the nebula deck that has the telescope that relies on those celestial packs now i can't buy any of those that completely locks me out of you know playing the celestial deck or the um nebula deck on the high stakes right now the booster packs give you a lot of different things and so if you're playing flushes for example if you're playing uh three of a kind or sorry 
full house, four of a kind, five of a kind, those types of things. You need the tarot cards for the deck manipulation, the deck building, right? Like the deck building is a core component of the game. If you don't have the Arcana packs, you don't get to do any deck building, right? And if you, you know, the celestial packs give you the planet cards, you know, one of the benefits of playing straights instead of flushes, straights, the planet cards give you twice as many chips, right? So straights are worth twice as many points as a flush. You can play half as many straights. Instead of playing two flushes, you just play one straight and that's enough to win. That's assuming that you get the planet cards, planet cards that are coming from these celestial packs. If you don't have these celestial packs, well, that's going to lock you out of those as well. And so generally speaking, having these increasing booster pack costs, that completely locks you out of this entire mechanic, right? You're completely locked out of booster packs. No booster packs on orange stake and higher, which means also then you can't play any of those higher ranking hands, any of those builds that rely on the booster packs. And so when people say like, oh, I f it feels like on the high stakes, you can only win with high card and pairs or, you know, sometimes two pair. Um, I think there is some merit to that. And this is part of why, you know, the other hands that, you know, rely on or benefit a lot from those booster packs. If you don't have those booster packs, you can't do those builds anymore. All right. So the change is the new thing is we've got this perishable mechanic and so basically what it does is it turns jokers into food jokers and so you know about you know on the black stick and higher we have the eternal jokers where you know it's a joker that you can't sell this is the opposite of eternal kind of right where okay it's a 30 percent chance to have a perishable sticker uh this by the way is the same chance to have uh eternals so eternals are 30 percent perishable perishables also 30%. Um, it's close enough to about one in three. I think of it as one in three, but uh, a third of your jokers are going to have this where it disables them after five rounds. And so basically, you know, random jokers in the shop will have this sticker on them and they'll behave like, you know, these food jokers, right? These perishable jokers that disappear after a number of rounds. And so there is some strategy around this where, you know, if I buy it, instead of thinking of these Eternals as like, you know, I do I want to have this in my final build? Now, if I take this, is it going to run out before I'm done with it? Am I going to be desperately trying to replace it with something else? Is it still worth the cost, even if I know it's going to run out on me? And also here, you know, this disabling is based on a number of rounds here. And so if you have a Joker that you need to survive for longer, you can skip more potentially you know if it doesn't ruin you to skip you can skip in order to preserve your jokers for longer potentially so you know i think that's kind of a what i really like about this change is it changes your joker buying decisions right um and i think that's great on the gold stake here again we're removing you know what was previously this minus one hand size so Minus one hand size is a huge difference. Um, the plus one hand size difference from like going from hand size eight to hand size nine is not really that big a deal. But then in the opposite direction, the difference between hand size seven and eight is huge. And so with this minus one hand size, generally speaking, okay, that's going to make it harder to find the hands that you're looking for. This is on top of, we already have the blue stake giving us minus one discard. And so we have fewer discards and this makes each of our discards less powerful. And so with the minus one hand size, you know, let's say you're holding on to four cards. Now with your two discards, you only get to redraw three cards twice. So you get to see six total new cards. And so with a starting hand of seven plus six new cards, 13 cards total. Okay, now make whatever hand that you're going to make with only 13 cards uh, is miserable. And so again, here people saying like, oh, only, you know, the low hands, only high card and pairs are viable on the high stakes. This is why. This is what they're talking about. I think that's totally valid uh, complaint here. And so, okay, we're getting rid of that. What we want to do is, we don't necessarily want to make the game easier. You know, we still want it to be hard at the highest stakes. We still want the high stakes to be a challenge. What we want to do is we want to uh, improve diversity, right? We want to improve, you know, so that you can play a lot of different builds, right? 
And so with this perishable mechanic, this mechanic that's kind of affecting, you know, the value of jokers, having your jokers die on you, this is hurting your economy, right? Like you're constantly having to spend more money to replace your jokers. So that is adding some difficulty to the game, right? But then this still allows you to, you know, invest your money maybe in more consumables, more booster packs that are giving you permanent bonuses that are not going to run out on you. Or maybe, okay, maybe I don't like buying any perishable jokers. I'm just not going to buy any. Then they only show up a third of the time, so you could just spend extra money on rerolls in order to find more different jokers. And so kind of you could think of this as, oh, all the jokers cost more now. I just have to spend more money to reroll before I buy my jokers. On average, all of the jokers cost more, right? Now, with the gold stake change here, instead of having the minus one hand size, we're having another sticker here. It's going to be this rental mechanic. And so, again, jokers are going to have a 30% chance, 30% chance to have this rental sticker. And then it's going to be compatible with eternals and perishables as well. Um, perishable and eternal, those are you know, sort of incompatible, you're not going to get a joker that's both eternal and perishable. Like that would be miserable, right? You pick up an eternal joker and it's like, okay, well, I'm stuck with it forever. I can't sell it. But then also it's going to be disabled after five rounds and it's going to become useless. It's going to be dead. Like that's redundant, right? Like that's already true. If you pick up a common eternal, it's going to be outscaled by whatever else you're doing in the late game. And so your common eternals already become blank over time so we don't need to pile on this perishable on top of that however what we're going to have instead is this rental sticker rental sticker is compatible with both eternals and perishables and the way that it functions is uh let's see if i can grab this here so all of the jokers it reduces the upfront cost and so you know, something that's like kind of nice about the black stake, you know, about the eternal jokers is that's not always a drawback if jokers can't be destroyed. And so, for example, you have synergy with the Ankh uh, spectral card that, you know, is supposed to destroy random jokers. Well, it can't destroy your eternal. So like that's kind of neat. Um, the uh, madness joker is supposed to destroy random jokers, can't destroy your eternal. So that's kind of like useful as well. So the same thing with this rental here. Um, it reduces the upfront cost of whatever uh, jokers that you're buying. So it could be like a rare joker normally going to cost you $10 for a blueprint. Now you pay $1 upfront. That's it. That's huge. That's great. That's interesting. The trade-off is, um, I'm sorry that's got cut off here, but um, the trade-off is every round the rental price is $3. Every round you pay $3 to keep that joker around. And so, you know, if you wanted to keep it for a short time, you could. But generally speaking, you know, what you're looking for is what is like a high powered joker that I want to hold on to forever and I'm willing to pay for, right? Like a blueprint, I'd be willing to pay $3 to keep it around. Um, if I had, I don't know, some kind of scaling joker like ride the bus or the green joker or the pants, I might be willing to pay $3 every round to keep that around. And so generally speaking, let's say if you have just one of these rental jokers, you know, they only show up 30% of the time. So most of the time, okay, you have one around for a while and then you sell it or you just don't buy any. You could just ignore, avoid all of the rentals. But let's say on average you have one rental. Every round you have three less dollars, basically. And so that three less dollars every round, that's going to make the game a little bit harder but it's not going to affect the, you know, diversity of the metagame, right? Whatever build that you want to do, you could still do it. It's just going to cost you more money, right? And so I think that's a great change. I think that's a great way to uh, balance the higher stakes. You know, we want to keep the higher stakes. We still want it to be difficult. We still want it to be a challenge. And so I think, you know, hurting you in the bank. All right, moving on here, we've got the... Eternals now apply to uh, jokers and buffoon packs. Uh, this is just a bug fix, in my opinion. Um, and so, you know, before you can get Eternals in the shop, but you can't get Eternals in buffoon packs and booster packs. And so, like, buffoon packs would be kind of like a safe way to get uh, Eternals. Um, I always thought that was kind of disappointing as, like, a way of getting around what is a very fun mechanic, interesting mechanic, these Eternal jokers. 
And so now eternals apply to buffoon packs as well. That also means all of these other stickers, the perishable jokers and the rental jokers, they show up in buffoon packs as well, just like eternals. All right, next we've got in the first shop here, you're guaranteed to have a normal buffoon pack. And so rather than have, you know, all of these different pack options in the first shop, guaranteed buffoon pack. So this is going to lower, you know, for one, this is going to raise the floor, right? So a common complaint from folks is, you know, we get through the first couple rounds here. And if we low roll in the shop, if we don't see any jokers in the shop, if we don't see any useful jokers in the shop, you know, maybe you find like an X mult joker in the shop, but it's like too early and it doesn't actually help you in the early game. That's going to end your run, or at least that's the you know prevailing thoughts here. Um, I like to think, you know, you can survive anti one pretty consistently without any jokers. And, you know, typically it's best to do that, best to not buy anything. That way you can keep saving your money for interest. Unless maybe, you know, there is a joker that gives you money and that way that way it's worth buying or you know there's a joker that gives scaling and so it's worth buying early but generally speaking okay you could survive without getting a joker in the first shop but you know for folks who are struggling to survive in anti one you know even on the lower stakes here or you know it's not really about the anti one boss because the boss is only 600 points you could do that with two five card hands or you could do that with three kind of medium hands. It's really, you know, not until you get to the next round in anti two where the requirement is 800 points. That's when it's really out of reach and that's when you really need to have a joker by then. And so here we're guaranteeing now uh, you get a buffoon pack. Buffoon pack and a guarantee that you get jokers. Um, you get a choice of two. And so you're not guaranteed to get a scoring joker, but you do have much better chances than you had before. You know, in addition to the existing shop offerings, you do get this guaranteed buffoon pack. Um, especially if we're talking about on the higher stakes now. You know, if we're talking about the higher stakes, then, okay, it's a little bit harder to survive an anti-2 without any scoring jokers. And so, okay, fine, we'll give you the, the scoring joker to start. Or, sorry, we'll give you the buffoon pack to start. One thing that this does do is it removes one of the packs. It replaces it with a buffoon pack, right? And so it's less likely that you'll get a spectral pack. It's less likely that you get a spectral pack in the first shop, which, you know, for just normal runs, if you're not doing a whole lot of resetting, like that's fine, right? You'd rather, for most folks, you'd rather have the buffoon pack anyway. Um, if you are, you know, doing the restarting for you know, particularly interesting starts, particularly powerful starts. In my opinion, the most powerful start is restarting for Immolate from a Spectra pack. That's going to happen about, you know, half as often now since one of the packs is guaranteed to be a buffoon pack. Also, this is going to change um, if there's a seed that you like that you've been playing a lot. Once the this change goes live, this is going to change the RNG, right? The seed is going to change if the first pack is now guaranteed to be a buffoon instead of you know, whatever else it was going to be. All right, we've got in the, let's see here. We have a preview for upcoming blinds and tags. And so, you know, currently, you know, if you're in the small blind or the big blind, you can go to your run info and you can see, you can see what's upcoming, right? You can see what the boss is. You can see what the next, you know, skip tag is in the big blind or whatever. Now, you know, even after you beat the boss, currently you can see back in time. Currently you can see the current round that you just did, current boss that you just beat. Now you'll be able to see ahead of time. After you beat the boss, you'll see what the next boss is. And so, you know, already in the next round, after the next small blind, you can see the boss and you have like, you know, two rounds ahead of time to prepare for the boss. Now you just have an extra round. You can see ahead of time, you can prepare for that. You can also now uh, preview the skip tags and you can see what the next small blind skip tag is going to be. And so, okay, you know, you just, you get to see the boss a little bit ahead of time you know, more so than you already can. And then, you know, if it's a boss that's going to mess you up, you know, like it's going to debuff all of your hearts, for example, now you have more time to prepare for it. All right, we've got um, 
Also, this allows you to see, you know, if you can see ahead, you can see what the scoring requirements are going to be in the next round. And so what I've done, you know, most of the time in my runs, I just go to the collection and the collection tells you what all the blind sizes are. So what all the scoring requirements are. Now you don't have to do that. And I think that's a great quality of life change. All right, next we've got uh, on the challenge runs, some of the bosses are removed. And so, for example, um, Mad World, that's the one where you have the Paradolia Joker that makes all your cards face cards. And so if you get the plant, the plant is going to debuff all of your face cards. You're just going to have a bad time. You know, it's not unbeatable. It's just sad. It's just miserable. And so, okay, we're going to remove the plant from the Mad World here. We're also going to remove the Verdant Leaf from a couple of these. Verdant Leaf, that's the one where... Um, it debuffs all your cards unless you sell a joker and so okay if you are on the non-perishable challenge where you have all of the eternal jokers then you can't sell any jokers and so you can't remove the debuff again that's not unbeatable it's just really sad it's just really annoying and so okay we're going to remove the verdant leaf from non-perishable uh, typecast is similar where you get part way through the run and it turns all your jokers into eternal and so, okay, we'll remove it from that. Jokerless challenge, of course, you don't have any jokers, eternal or otherwise. So we're gonna remove the verdant leaf because that's the annoying one. And then we're also going to remove the crimson heart and the amber acorn. So those are the ones that affect your jokers, but if you don't have any jokers, that's no drawback, that's no effect. And so after removing these three bosses, there's only two bosses left. So Jokerless is now either the Cerulean Bell, which is going to mess with your selecting cards and like making hands and stuff like that, or the Violet Vessel. So, you know, for me, taking away the Verdant Leaf here doesn't automatically make the Jokerless challenge easier. Like it removes the annoying one, but the Purple Vessel, you know, how high the scoring requirement is, it is still pretty tough. So on average, I think the Jokerless challenge is still kind of the same. It's still just as difficult. All right, next we've got uh, you know some changes to the planet numbers here. So Saturn is receiving a buff here. We've got plus three molt instead of plus two molt. Uh, that's it. So you know it's still the same thirty chips. We're just increasing the molt by fifty percent. So from plus two to plus three, fifty percent more molt, fifty percent more scoring from straights, kind of. And so I don't think straights need a buff. I think straights are, you know, plenty powerful. Uh, you know, I've demonstrated we can be successful with straights. I think straights are less successful on the current version of the high stakes on the gold stake just because you have the less discards and the less uh, hand size. And so it's hard to make straights. It's also hard to make flushes, you know, with the minus one hand size. So it's not specific to straights as the problem. And, you know, already straights score twice as much as flushes. And I don't necessarily think straights are twice as difficult to draw. So I don't think straights need a buff. But, hey, if you are hesitant to give straights a try, maybe this is a compelling reason to. Um, this change is mostly not because straights need the buff, but because people think straights need the buff. This is, uh, this is just PR. This is just optics. People don't like straights, so we're just going to keep buffing it until... People like straights or are at least willing to give it a try. Neptune here also getting a buff. Uh, we're going from plus three molt is being plus four molt. Again here, I don't think straight flushes. I don't think Neptune, you know, needs the buff. Um, but, you know, I'm not going to complain about it either. You want to give it a buff here. You know, I think, you know, between... Series, Eris, Neptune, between flush five, flush house, and then straight flushes, I think... Straight flushes are the most interesting to pull off, right? And so the one that's most interesting to pull off, that's the one that should be worth the most points, right? So here, straight flushes, we're going to go from plus three molt to plus four molt. Okay, that's going to be a tiny change there. Um, for Eris, we're going to change it to, we're going to increase the chips. So from 40 chips for a flush five is now 50 chips. For flush houses instead of three molt is now four molt. And so, you know, kind of between the two of these, currently the status is it's 40 chips and it's three molt for both of these. Both of these have 
the same numbers, you know, for flush five and flush houses. And I think that's kind of disappointing. It's kind of disappointing that they kind of scale the same way because, you know, it's much better to go for flush fives than flush houses because, you know, whatever kind of jokers you have, synergistic jokers that care about a certain rank or care about a certain suit, you have the most benefit to just play all five of the same card, the one rank, the one suit. And so, you know, kind of diminishes the value um, of flush houses. Then, okay, well, why would you go for flush houses when you could just go for flush fives? It's not that much harder to go for flush fives. Actually, in some cases, it's easier to go for flush fives because you can use, uh, you know, death card is going to give you copies of the same card over and over again. And so, you know, here, both of these are getting buffed, but they're getting buffed in different directions. Flush five is going to get more chips. Flush houses are going to get more molt. Um, I think between the two of these, I think the molt is the more powerful buff compared to the chips here. Like if we just go by percentages, uh, the flush house is getting, you know, 30% more molt, whereas the flush five is only getting 25% 20 more chips. Okay, but that's not really how it works, right? So, you know, as far as like the end game, you know, really high scoring builds, when you play a flush house, you have whatever the base molt is. And then on top of that, you have glass cards that give you uh, times molt. You have, um, what is it, steel cards that give you times molt. You have uh, things like tree belay and idol and the bloodstone and, you know, these other sources of times molt. And so what happens is you, it really just matters what your base molt is and then whatever plus molt bonuses that you have from your other jokers become completely irrelevant. Um, you know, once you have all of these times molts from uh, polychrome cards and glass cards and steel cards. And so I think the more powerful of these is going to be whichever one has the higher base molt then you know that number gets multiplied by like i said the steel cards and the glass cards so flush houses are going to dominate is what this says to me um instead flush fives getting the bonus chips here if it was the other way around if flush five got the extra molt then you know if you play something like the idol and you get times two on all of the cards that you play as part of your flush five that's going to be worth way more than anything that you could do with the flush house and so with the flush house having the higher base molt now, you know, there's this tension between do I play more of the same card for more of these, you know, times two bonuses or, you know, if you're playing uh, with the, the ancient joker, you know, the times 1.5 bonuses or do I play, you know, more of the same card for the flush five here where I don't have the high base mult. I have some other different compensation here um, in the form of plus chips. Either way, everything's going to be bigger than what it currently is. All right, next we've got uh, some changes to the tags here. And so if you've seen my, um, you know, Joker, or sorry, the uh, skip tag tier list, we kind of said the tags are in a bad place right now. The The value proposition is, is very low, right? So most of the time you shouldn't be skipping and we want to see some improvements here to make it more worth skipping so for example here we've got uncommon tag now makes the uncommon joker free and so if you skip the uncommon tag says okay you're guaranteed to get an uncommon joker this is going to guarantee that we get an uncommon joker and the one that we get is free and so you know however much value that the uncommon tag had before now it's like plus six dollars on top of that if i make it worth six dollars more than it previously was now is it worth it to skip the answer is no um it was never the cost of the uncommon jokers you know random jokers in the shop it was never the cost that was the issue right you know if the you take the uncommon tag and you get a guaranteed uncommon and the common cost or the uncommon cost 20 bucks or whatever if it's a good one for your build if it's synergistic you take it anyway, like it's worth the money. Um, if it's not synergistic, it doesn't matter if it's free. Uh, it just doesn't fit in your build, you just don't take it, right? Um, if it's free though, you take it and then you sell it. And so, you know, you can get back like three bucks worth of value there. And so maybe, you know, a minor change here is if the uncommon tag whiffs in the sense that it gives you something that you don't want or it gives you something that you don't need, 
baseline minimum, you can always get three bucks. You can always just buy and then sell. Buy it for zero, sell it for three bucks, ish. So, you know, really what I want to see here with the uncommon tag, what I want to see is instead of giving me an uncommon, a random joker that I don't know, right? So if I don't know what it is, then it's not worth gambling for. But if you tell me ahead of time what the joker is going to be, then I can decide whether or not I want it. And so like, you know, the way the orbital tag works, um, you, it tells you what hand it's going to buff. And then based on that inf information, you can decide whether or not to take it. So it says, okay, the orbital tag has, uh, it's going to give three levels to flushes. And it's like, oh, okay, well, if I'm on flushes, that's huge value. I'll take the orbital tag. Um, if instead it was, oh, it's going to buff a random unspecified hand by five levels, let's say. You know, it offered you five levels, but it was random. It didn't tell you what it was. Would you take that tag? Would you take that unknown orbital tag for five levels? Like five levels is a lot, but it's random. So it could just be nothing. Most of the time you don't take that. Or what if it was, it's going to give you eight levels to a random hand. Would you take that skip for this orbital tag? Maybe. I mean, if you make the number big enough, then maybe it's worth it even if it's, you know, because if you get eight levels to a random planet, then you can just pivot now. Oh, that's way bigger than anything that I was already doing, right? And so the same thing with this uncommon tag, what I would want to see is the Joker preview. Tell me what the Joker is, and then I can decide whether or not it fits into my build. Because currently what this does is I skip, I get a random uncommon, and of all the possible random uncommons, I'm going to get something that doesn't help me. Most of the time doesn't help me, right? I see plenty of uncommons in the shop just re-rolling and just seeing more shops. And so it's better not to skip, to just see more uncommons that way, rather than this guaranteed uncommon, even if it's free. Making it free doesn't move the needle at all. Same with the rare tag here. Uh, the rare is now free. And so again, this has kind of like a, a lower floor here where if you see the, a rare card that you don't need you just buy it and then sell it for four bucks um, or some of them sell for five bucks um, you know for the purposes of like um, you know anti one restarts re-rolling in anti one you can take these you can take the uncommon the rare because they're free that matters much more in the early game in the late game, the money doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that it's free, but in the early game, it does help that it's free. And so, okay, if you give me a free rare, I, and it's my literal first Joker, I have nothing else, I can try to build around it. I'm more willing to build around it. All right, uh, the negative hollow foil, you know, all of the addition tags also make, you know, whatever joker you get free. Again, here, this is not moving the needle anymore. All this does is add $5 worth of value to whatever it currently was at. Um, you know, same thing as the uncommon and the rare tag. So still, you know, as exciting as all of this is, this is a trap here. Um, the skip tags are still not at all worth it. Maybe one that's slightly more worth it, the investment tag here. The investment tag, that's the one where you get money after you beat the next boss, whatever it is. And so currently $15 is kind of medium even for anti-1 when you have no money. And then, you know, already by anti-2, $15 just is nothing. Um, it's not worth skipping for, especially if you don't get that benefit right away. You know, one of the problems with all of these... You take the skip tag and you don't get any benefit right away. You still have to beat the next round without any help. You take the skip, your jokers didn't change yet because you haven't seen the shop yet. Your deck hasn't changed because you haven't seen the shop yet. And so you need to take on this higher scoring requirement without any buff. And if you survive, then you get the bonus, you know, from whatever it is in the shop. Um, I think that is you know, a design choice and not necessarily a wrong design choice, but that is a reason why maybe you shouldn't be skipping is if you're not able to win the next round. Um, you know, the same for, you know, even the tag that gives you like $40 when you skip, sometimes you don't take the $40 because if I take the skip, I can't win the next round. I don't get to spend that money if I just lose, right? Raising this from $15 to $25 helps a little bit. Uh, definitely now, you know, in anti one, this is like way too powerful for anti one. Um, for anti two, it's about right. 
Um, for maybe antis three and four, it's a little underpowered, and then you know you stop taking this after anti four. But you know that's kind of the point, right? You know, with most of these skip tags, you know the local thunk himself. He said, you know, the plan is you should only be skipping a couple of times per run, you know, maybe one time per run, maybe two times at most, and then that's it. And mostly kind of in the early game, not really in the late game, just in the early game to sort of uh, get things off the ground here. You know, for example, the early, the holographic foil tags in the anti one, just to get things started, uh, the top up tag, the mega buffoon pack you want to get early, but don't necessarily need later on. All right, we could talk about tags all day, but uh, you know, let's move on. Let's talk about the Joker changes here. So the first one's going to be the eight ball. So you know, if you're not familiar with the demo season, you know, before the full game was released, um, in the demo season, the eight ball used to give you tarot cards, and the way that it would work is any hand that contained at least a pair of eights would give you a tarot card. And so you could play a full house with either two or three eights. That would give you one tarot card. You could play four of a kind. That would give you one tarot card. A flush house, three of a kind, um, five of a kind. You know, either way, you would get a tarot card from the eight ball. The thing that was problematic about this was it was sort of self-enabling. And so the eight ball would give you tarot cards. You would use the tarot cards to make more eights. And then now if you have more eights, you can just play, okay, here's a pair of eights, here's another pair of eights, here's another full house with eights. And you could get, you know, eight eights in the deck. You could play four hands that each contain two eights, and you would just get four tarot cards uh, every round, right? You would get way too many tarot cards, and it would just keep snowballing. It would just keep enabling itself. And so a change that happened you know before the full release of the game the eight ball was changed to give you planet cards now or you currently currently gives you planet cards so no longer has this self enabling nature here the eight ball doesn't allow you to get more eights whereas the superposition previously had either tarot card or planet card now in the current version of the game gives you tarot cards i think that's great i think uh superposition is a little bit on the weak side, a little bit underpowered, though, you know, as a common joker, maybe don't complain. It's common. What more do you want from a common, right? Um, the superposition does have this kind of self-enabling aspect where you get the tarot cards and it helps you make the straights, helps you, you know, if you remove cards from the deck or use death to give you copies of your aces, you can make more superposition straights more easily. Um, it's not to the same extent. It's not to the same extreme that the eight ball had, right? And so I think uh, superposition is not in a bad place. I do think the eight ball giving the tarot or giving the planet cards was kind of terrible. Kind of you know pretty underpowered, pretty underwhelming. You know the the spaceman would give you you know level up your poker hand one out of four times that you play that poker hand. The eight ball would give you a random planet. That's a one in nine chance that it upgrades the poker hand that you're interested in. Um, so that's kind of terrible, right? Compared to the spaceman. And so now the entirely new effect, uh, the eight ball gives tarot cards again. The way that it works is every time an eight is scored, it's going to have a one in four chance of spawning a tarot card. And so, you know, let's say you play two eights. Let's say you play a pair of eights. You know, in the old, in the ancient version of the eight ball, that pair of eights would give you one tarot card. Now, each eight has a 25% chance of giving you a tarot card. So kind of on average, a pair of eights gives you half a tarot card. Or you play two pairs of eights or, you know, four of a kind eights. That gives you on average one tarot card. So it is weaker than it has been in the past. But I think it's also fine. So, you know, which is easier? Is it easier to get a straight that has an ace for this superposition or is it easier to play four eights not necessarily in the same hand you can kind of spread them out right like you could play a pair of eights and then redraw and then play an eight as part of a straight or something like that um i think this is a cool idea i think this is very flexible i think this still is kind of self-enabling you know you get the tarot cards and you make more eights and then you're able to you know kind of snowball this eight ball i think that's cool i think that's fun 
Um, one thing that's kind of like tricky about this or kind of like neat about this is re-trigger jokers. So currently the sock and buskin allows you to re-trigger your face cards. The hack allows you to re-trigger twos through fives. The dusk allows you to re-trigger eights. You know, Dusk allows you to re-trigger whatever your final hand is. And then the Seltzer also allows you to re-trigger. Um, you can also do Pareidolia to turn your eights into face cards, and then you can re-trigger them after you turn them into face cards. And so, you know, or red seals. You can make a red seal eight, and then it will re-trigger more times and then potentially give you more tarot cards. So I think that's a fun kind of build-around idea. And what's also cool about this, you know, something I consider it's a feature, not a bug, is let's say you play five of kind eights and then it just hits the one and four a bunch and it pumps out a bunch of tarot cards. You're still only limited to only two consumable slots or, you know, maybe you get the crystal ball voucher and you actually have three consumable slots now. So the maximum number of tarot cards that you can spawn in one hand, even with, you know, infinitely many re-triggers, is still only two tarot cards per hand or three tarot cards per hand. So as like a balance feature, I think that's a really cool balance feature. Keeps this from being, you know, busted, but also allows this to be kind of fun and interesting. I think people are going to complain a lot about this one, you know, similar to the Bloodstone. Bloodstone has like the chance to give you the X-Mult and then you know, it causes people to lose, you know, if they're relying too much on that. And so, you know, people complain about the wheel not hitting. People complain about the spaceman not hitting. People are going to complain about the eight ball not giving tarot cards. Too bad. This is great. This is incredibly powerful. You know, that's the, that's the way that you beat, you know, bad RNG. That's the way that you beat variance is you just do it more times. Right? You just play more eights, and then on average, over time, it'll balance itself out. All right, we've got a change to the blue seal here. Blue seal previously, it would give you a random planet card if you held the blue seal in hand. And so, you know, we also have the gold cards. Gold cards give you three bucks if you hold them in hand. You could put the blue seal on top of that. And the question is, you know, how does, how does a blue seal compare to just a gold card giving you just flat money? right? Like random planets in the shop, they cost three bucks to buy a planet card. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're worth three bucks, right? That doesn't necessarily mean that you get three dollars worth of value there. And so if you just get a random planet, that's not, that has a very low chance to actually help you. So most of the time, whatever planet you get, you just sell it for a dollar. And so the previous version of the blue seal, um, terrible, uh, very little benefit from that you know, compared to the purple seal, which just gives you a tarot card. And tarot cards have much higher chance of being actually relevant or useful to you. Also, you know, discarding purple cards is way easier than trying to hold blue cards in hand. And so there better be a much better reward for the blue seal now. So the change is, okay, it's going to create a planet card. So that's the same. But it's going to create a planet card of the poker hand that you play. So whatever poker hand that you play that ends the round, you get the planet card for that poker hand. That's huge. You know, that's like on the level of the uh, burnt joker, right? The burnt joker, you can discard a poker hand in order to level it up, you know, guaranteed get one level every round. Like that's a huge rate, right? You know, compared to the spaceman, the spaceman, you get to upgrade, uh, you know, one in four times that you play a hand. Here, as long as the planet card is part of your scoring hand, you know, whatever the final hand is. So it actually has similar flavor to the blue seal before. So the blue seal before you kind of wanted to hold on to it. You know, that was the reward. You hold on to it in your hand and you get the planet card. So here what it's saying is the blue seal, you still have to hold on to it so that it makes it into your final hand. And then once it is there in your final hand, then you play it and you get the guaranteed level up. It's not a random planet card. It's not a one in 10 chance to help you. It's a guarantee that it's gonna help you. Now, one way that you could implement this is instead of giving you a random planet card, like why doesn't it just upgrade the hand, right? Like that's technology that already exists. The spaceman does that. Why didn't it just upgrade the hand? Well, 
you know, having it as giving you the planet cards, again, we have limited number of consumable slots. So even if you have five blue seals, the maximum number of planet cards that you can get is still just two, um, or maybe three if you have the crystal ball voucher. So, you know, one thing that this does and one thing that the uh, eight ball change does, this makes crystal ball more interesting. I know a lot of people complain about the crystal ball. You know, they don't th think that the plus one consumable slot is very useful. Of course, they're wrong, but, you know, that's what they think. And so this is, you know, in a way kind of a buff to the crystal ball or at least makes the crystal ball more interesting and more worth taking. But anyway, you know, here there's a cap. You can only get two upgrades for the one hand, you know, assuming you get the two blue seals. So I think, you know, the first blue seal that you get is going to be a huge upgrade. And so, you know, you could consider if I'm playing flushes, you know, I want to prioritize uh, tarot cards. I want to prioritize, prioritize Arcana Packs and the purple seal. If I'm playing, you know, straights and straight flushes, maybe I want to prioritize this blue seal instead for the additional scaling that I get from the planet cards. Don't sleep on the planet cards, right? Every planet card is like a negative joker. It improves your score, but it doesn't take up a joker slot. Uh, the second blue seal that you get is not going to be as useful. And then by the time you get to the third blue seal, okay, that's too many, right? Whereas like purple seals, you can kind of get away with having, you know, 10 or 15 of them in your deck. Also, something that I find interesting about this is it kind of takes away from, you know, in your final hand, you want to have like red seal cards and like, I don't know, polychrome cards or whatever. Like you want to have high scoring cards. And if you have a blue seal instead of, let's say, a gold seal or instead of a red seal, you're trading whatever value is for this permanent bonus. Interesting. All right, now for the uh, Clever and Mad Jokers, you know, previously required you to play four of a kind. Um, that was terrible because, you know, let, currently uh, Mad Joker gives you like plus 20 molt if your hand contains four of a kind. It doesn't matter how big it is. Like if you change the number to, oh, it gives you plus 50 molt and the Mad Joker shows up in your first shop, do you take it? No, because you can't play four of a kind, um, or at least not at the beginning. You can play four of a kind later after you've done some deck manipulation, and by the time you've done all that deck manipulation, now you have a better other joker that gives you plus molt anyway. You don't need the plus 20 from the mad joker. You don't need a plus 50 mad joker. You just have a plus 50 bus already anyway. And so, okay, mad joker and clever joker, the problem wasn't how big the bonus was. The problem was it's just too hard to play four of a kind early. And for these common jokers that are going to show up very early commonly, you want them to be more accessible. And so the changes, instead of being four of a kind, now uh, is a two pair effect. Sorry, I got cut off here, but uh, so now you get a bonus when your hand contains two pair. So, you know, similar to the pants, you get a bonus for containing two pair, which means also applies to full houses. It also applies to flush houses. So another kind of problem with the mad and clever jokers before is if you're playing four of a kind, it's kind of incompatible with flushes, unless you're playing a flush house, or, or sorry, unless you're playing a flush five. It's kind of incompatible with uh, full houses or whatever, right? And so changing this to contain two pair, now for the different early common jokers that you can have, you can mix and match. You can have um, this two pair joker combined with this, you know, contains three of a kind joker um, combined with you could do the two pair with a flush also. You don't have to go full on flush five or flush house. You can just play two pair that are all the same suits. Um, so I think this is great. I think this is great for, um, you know, getting you more early game technology, early game scoring technology. I think it's cool that two pair is kind of flexible and compatible with a lot of different builds, more different builds now. All right. Um, yeah, I guess also with the, uh, you know, if you're trying to play full houses, getting the zany joker, that's the one that gives you plus molt for three of a kind, or, you know, hands that contain at least three of a kind. It's hard to get full houses early, so it's hard to get trios early, hard to get three of a kind early. What you can do now is you can kind of like early on rely on your two pairs, and then later on after you get the deck manipulation upgrade to full houses. 
Uh, York, that's one of the legendary jokers, is getting a whole new effect. So previously, you would have to discard a set number of times. So discard 23 times in order to get some X mult bonus. Um, you know, it's supposed to be a big bonus, but X5 is not really a big bonus. It could be bigger, like it could be, you know, discard 23 times to get, um, you know, an X20 bonus. You know, would you get excited about York giving you an X20 bonus? Maybe. It's still really hard to get the 23 discards. It really depends on when you pick up the York and kind of like what would happen before is you'd pick up York in anti 4, which seems like, oh, that's not that late. You know, I still got, you know, four antis left from my York. And it just wouldn't come online. You know, you would do all the discarding that you can. You'd get to the end and it just wouldn't be active. Or it would be active, but it would only be active for the final boss. And it wouldn't be active for all the time that you've been holding on to it. And so it's better to just replace this uh, legendary Joker with just anything else. Even just an X3 Joker. You don't need X5. You just need X3, right? And so, okay, what's going to be different here? Okay, it's still going. It's going to be uh, X mult scaling, so it's ga gaining X mult every time we do a thing. So similar to um, you know Kanio, uh, Kanio gets X mult every time you delete a face card. Now York is going to get X mult every time you discard twenty three cards. So not twenty three discards, but individual cards discarded. If you throw away five cards at a time, that counts. If you in a round, use three discards, discarding five cards at a time. That's, you know, already halfway there. So, you know, the way that you could think of this is, you know, every two rounds, this gains plus one X, right? X mult goes up by one every two rounds on average. Like that's, that's pretty good scaling, right? Like that's better than um, constellation scaling. That's better than um, the vampire scaling. Um, that's typically... You know, with the Kanio, the Kanio goes up in bursts. You know, like it'll go up two in one round and it'll kind of stabilize and like not go up for a couple of rounds. So this is probably better than Kanio, actually. It's way easier to just do the discards than it is to, you know, create and delete face cards. Uh, the reason why it's 23, by the way, the reason why the previous version was 23 is um, it's a reference. Um, I think it's Hamlet. It's a Hamlet reference. Um, Something happens after 23 days to this uh, York guy here. And so that's why it's 23 cards being discarded. But I think this is a great change. I think this brings York in line with Kanio. I think it's still not as good as Trebley. I think it's not as good as, you know, of course, Perkeo is game breaking, but it's definitely better than Chico. All right, the Magician Tarot card, you know, this is for the fans of the lucky cards. Now, instead of giving you one lucky card, now it gives you two lucky cards. Right, and so, you know, thinking of a lucky card as kind of like similar power level to a molt card, molt cards giving you plus four molt or a similar power level to a bonus card giving you plus 30 chips. Okay, why not? Now you get twice as many lucky cards. You get to do all your lucky card stuff. Um, personally, I like lucky cards. Um, I don't really think of them in terms of the plus molt. Um, I think of them mostly as like money generators. So on average, every time you play a lucky card, it'll give you about a dollar on average, right? So you have a one in 15 chance to get $20. So low chance to get a high amount of money on average. It's about $1 every time you play a lucky card. So yeah, I think this is um, a reasonable change. Um, there was, you know, between the demo season and then the full release of the game, there was a buff or there was a change to the emperor or the empress card that gives you the plus molt card. So instead of plus three molt per card, it changed to plus four molt. Um, the uh, bonus cards from the hierophant changed from plus twenty chips to plus thirty chips, and so all these you know different tarot cards getting a buff. The magician, the lucky cards didn't get a buff for a while, and so this is just bringing it more in line with those other ones. Also, this has implications for. Um, the Lucky Cat. So the Lucky Cat, that's the one where um, it gains X Molt every time a Lucky Card triggers. Every time it, you know, does the thing. It either gives you the Molt or the money. You know, it says it su successfully triggers or whatever it says. And so being able to get more Lucky Cards at one time means you can grow, you can scale the Lucky Cat faster. 
which is something the Lucky Cat needed anyway. You know, if that, I, I really like the design of the Lucky Cat, just the power level maybe wasn't quite there. All right, now we also have with the, oh, also with the, um, you know, the magician here with all the lucky cards, there is kind of like an upper limit on this. You know, at the end of the day, you can only have five cards in one hand. And so, you know, making all of these extra lucky cards, there is kind of this uh, ceiling that you hit. All right, with the Midas Mask here, Midas Mask now only applies to scoring face cards. And so Midas Mask, that's the one where when you play a face card, it turns it into gold. Now only applies to the face card that actually score. You know, it used to be you could play high card and you can just dump in some random face cards in there and then all of them would turn to gold. It was way too easy to get 100% face cards gold in two rounds. Like that's it, that's all it would take. Um, and then you just sell the Midas Mask and you replace it with something else. And so, okay, on one hand, this is going to make it a little bit harder. It, you got to be a little bit more strategic about it. You know, if you want to play uh, a solo face card to guarantee that it scores as a high card, or whether you want to play a pair or you fit your face cards into like two pair or a full house or something like that, you know, whatever it is, whatever it's going to be, now they have to score, actually. And so that's a nerf to the Midas Mask. I think that's an, a necessary nerf. I think that's a good nerf. Um, I think also then there is some gains here. There is some benefit. And so before it used to be, you know, whatever face cards you throw them in, even if they don't score, of course, they're going to change. And so some of the time, you know, what you want to do, you know, let's say you're playing the ride the bus ride the bus is going to reset if you score a face card and sometimes you just want to throw away your face cards and so maybe i don't want all of my face cards to be gold maybe i want some of my face cards to be steel right and so i can play the hand with these unscoring face cards that way they don't get turned into gold if i don't score them i could do that strategically i could do that on purpose so there is you know some additional uh, strategy here that's introduced and I think that's cool uh, we've also got you know because of this nerf okay we're gonna re uh, reduce the cost as well uh, to match okay sure uh, the vampire vampire is ne in need of a lot of work here so before I talk about all the changes here you know what is the current state of the vampire the vampire you get the one card you know let's say hierophant or empress and Okay, from that one tarot card, Vampire grows twice. So, you know, you make two enhanced cards, it gets times uh, 0.2 from both of those. So that's times, you know, 0.4 or whatever. And so currently, Vampire grows way faster than, you know, similar jokers. Like Constellation is this uh, scaling joker where you buy planet cards to level it up. Now with the Vampire... Okay, currently it does the same thing, but instead of planet cards, it does tarot cards, you know, for these enhanced cards, and it just grows way too fast. Um, you know, some people doing this combo, you know, with the Midas Mask and the Vampire, you turn all your cards to gold, and then, you know, remove all of those, and you grow the Vampire super fast. That's not really the problem with the Vampire, you know, the fact that this combo exists, like, that's fine, you can have that combo, just the baseline Vampire experience uh, is just too powerful. Um, it just scales way too fast. And so number one change is um, the enhan enhancements are only removed from the scoring cards. And so on one hand, okay, then it's harder to put, you know, these random enhancements and just kind of throw them in and then have them get absorbed by the vampire. But, you know, for the same reason that the Midas mask has, you know, this additional strategy that's added to it. Now, if there's enhancements that you don't want to get removed, that you don't want the vampire to take away, you can sneak them in as non-scoring cards. So that's kind of, you know, not automatically a nerf. I think overall it is a nerf, but there is, you know, a little bit of new benefit there, being able to have non-scoring cards not get removed by the vampire. We've also got here the scaling uh, goes from instead of times uh, 0.2 scaling, now it's 0.1. Um, 0.1 per enhancement. And so, you know, kind of for these enhancement tarot cards that give you just the one enhancement, okay, that's going to be a 0.1. And then for the uh, enhancements that give you two cards, for example, the new lucky card gives you two cards. Um, that's two 
uh, point ones, right? So that's a total of point two. So this brings the scaling, you know, more in line with the constellation. And then the final nail in the coffin here, we've got the, it's a rare now instead of uncommon. And so, okay, I think, you know, with the first two changes here, you know, reducing, um, you know, how often you're able to sneak in these enhancements, reducing, you know, how quickly the growth is. Um, I think these two are enough for the vampire to still be uncommon, you know, maybe even like it would still be kind of the most powerful uncommon or it'd be like a very powerful uncommon. So I don't necessarily think that it needs to be rare, but I'm not actually upset that much if it does become rare. I think, you know, what this does is, you know, there's some complaints about, you know, if you take the Wraith spectral card or you take the rare tag, it gives you a random rare. And sometimes that rare is not something that you want. Well, now if we add the vampire to the rare pool, now it's more likely that you get a rare that you actually care about. Like if you get the vampire, you're going to be excited to get the vampire. I think also, you know, the vampire is different from Constellation in that it's a little bit weird, right? Like Constellation kind of rewards you for something that you're already doing, like you're already buying planet cards, whereas like vampire completely changes the game. Um, it changes the game as far as like your enhancements behave completely differently now if you have the vampire. And so I think that's a good reason for it to be rare instead of uncommon is it's going to, you know, it, it is that game changing. It is that game warping for it to justify being rare instead of uncommon. It's just going to show up less often. And I think that's fine. All right, um, uh, we've got the madness here. Let's see here. Only applies in small and big blinds, not on boss blind selection. So, you know, currently the madness has this effect. Okay, it's going to destroy a random joker, right? And then it's going to grow. Or actually what it does is it grows regardless. And then after it grows, then it destroys a random joker. And so... There's really no way to build around the madness. And so I kind of see people do this in kind of two different ways, right? Like it's it's really brutal. You can't really afford to lose random jokers. And so people don't take the madness. Or if they're playing on a uh, black stake with the eternal jokers that can't be destroyed by the madness, now madness is super powerful in that, you know, it can't destroy these eternals. So, you know, what's the change here? The change is um, the now only happens small and big blinds, not the boss blind. So it happens only two thirds of the time instead of, you know, all of the time. So that's gonna be a slight nerf to the scaling. It's not gonna grow as fast. However, it's gonna be a buff to the viability here. You know, you can choose to skip the small and big blinds and then go straight to the boss and then have the madness not destroy any of your jokers. And so like if you're in anti-8 and you already know you're good, you're safe, you can just skip the small and big blinds. You don't have to worry about something being destroyed. Like that, I think, makes the madness uh, more playable, more useful. I'm not entirely convinced about this. You know, I think skipping is still too bad. I think skipping is still terrible. And so if you're skipping to preserve your madness, um, you're also missing out on it doesn't grow when you skip. It just doesn't destroy your jokers when you skip. Um, and maybe for me, that's not a good enough reason to skip. So I think the madness could use a little bit more help, but I, you know, I don't have any ideas off the top of my head. So this is fine. This is an upgrade. Um, this is fine for the madness. Uh, to do list. To do list gives you money when you play specific poker hands, and it changes its mind. It tells you, you know, different poker hands to play. And, you know, a common frustrating experience is you pick up the to-do list and it switches to a hand that you can't easily play. Like, not that you can't play it, you just can't easily play it. And so it'll switch to four of a kind or it'll switch to, um, you know, straight flushes. Mostly straight flushes give people a lot of trouble. Um, if you've got a secret hand, it'll switch to a secret hand. It's going to require you to play your flush five that you played once but, you know, are not easily able to replicate. And so you would just get stuck. Your to-do list is stuck. Now it gives you no value. Now you just sell it. And so the change here is instead of changing every time you play a hand, every time it pays out, it's going to change always at the end of the round. 
And so, you know, here already in the patch notes to say, oh, it was, it's not going to get stuck on straight flush. If it's on straight flush for one round, next round it'll be a different hand. It's guaranteed to change also. Um, it's not going to stay the same. And so, okay, maybe one round it's on straight flush and you're a little bit sad about it, but then the next round it's on high card for the whole round. You get to play high card three times and get all that money from the to-do list. Um, you get to play pairs multiple times and get, you know, all that money from the to-do list. So, you know, overall, um, I think this is a huge buff. Um, or at least it's a, it's a good quality of life change. You know, like we said here, it's not going to get stuck on any particular poker hand. You can just keep holding on to it. It'll just keep changing. All right. The shortcut, the... You know, there's a little bit of confusion about how the shortcut works, you know, as far as like allowing these gaps of one. Actually, you have more than one gap is possible here. And so the short or the example here is 10, 8, 6, demonstrating, you know, between 10 and 8, there's a gap. Between 8 and 6, there's a gap. Um, you know, this is just to help out folks who, you know, misunderstood how the shortcut works. Um, part of that is they didn't read the tooltip anyway, and so updating, changing the tooltip, um, they're not going to read the new tooltip if they weren't reading the previous one. So, you know, I'm not sure who this actually helps, but yes, uh, this is how the shortcut works is you can have more than one gap. All right, the Ancient Joker. Um, Ancient Joker, the selection, it selects a random suit every round and then, you know, gives you X mult every time you play a card of that suit. Now it just no longer repeats, right? So you can't get stuck on spades twice in a row. Um, it's guaranteed to change. And, you know, knowing this, knowing that it's guaranteed to change, you can plan around this. And so if you're relying on it being, you know, let's say you're on the checker deck and it's like, okay, well, as long as it's hearts or spades, either one, then I'm kind of good. And then if it changes to something other than that, then I might be boned, right? I might lose. And so, okay, it's on spades right now. I know it's going to change. A third of the time it's going to switch to hearts, but two thirds of the time it's going to switch to something else. And so maybe that gives me an incentive to, you know, get rid of it, right? Replace it with something else. Like you pick it up from the shop temporarily, you use it for a while and you switch it to something else. Um, this is fine, okay, you know, if it's not going to repeat now. Um, i still not super happy where the Ancient Joker is. So the Castle Joker, the Rebate Joker, the way that those work is they choose a random card in your deck. So Rebate can only give you uh, a card that's in your deck, and it just picks whatever the rank of that card is. Same with Castle, it picks a random suit in your deck. And so if you have more of one suit or more of one rank, those things are more likely to get selected. The idol behaves the same way. The ancient joker is the only one, the only one that doesn't behave the same way. It just picks a random suit, you know, sort of uniformly between the four options. Um, and I think that greatly limits how useful the ancient joker is. It kind of limits you to a very specific build. You know, if you really want to maximize the ancient joker value, you're incentivized to have sort of an even split of different suits in your deck. So rather than, you know, homogenizing and get all of one suit, you have kind of an even split. And I don't know. What I don't like about that is it kind of conflicts with the rest of the game. And so, you know, in the game, often what you're looking for is you're looking for synergy, right? And so it's cool when different jokers have synergy with more different things, right? And so if we go up to like the mad and clever joker, here, you know, changing so that they have two pairs, then two pairs are really wide open, right? And you can have a lot of different hands. You can play two pair or full houses or flush houses. All of those contain two pair. Whereas, you know, here, the ancient joker, if you really want to maximize this, you know, have all different suits in your deck, then that conflicts with all of the other incentives of the game. Everything else in the game is screaming at you, play the same suit, play these flush variants, play straight flush, flush house, flush five. Um, you have the common jokers, the sinful jokers, like the greedy joker, giving you plus molt for every diamond that you play. You have the gem jokers, uh, the onyx aggie, giving you plus molt for every club that you play. Play all of the same suit. Well, the ancient joker says, wait, but what, what if you do the different thing? Well, you get partway through your run, you get to anti four or five, you're already done something else. And so when the ancient joker shows up, this rare joker that you spent your, um, 
you know, Wraith to get this rare Joker or you took a skip tag to get this rare Joker, this sucks. This doesn't fit into what you're already doing. Ancient Joker has a very low chance of fitting into what you're already doing. If you get the Ancient Joker earlier, of course, you can build around it, but it has a low chance of fitting into what you're doing. And so I think this sucks. I think the Ancient Joker still sucks. I think it's still in need of a rework. Swashbuckler, that's the one that gives you plus mult based on the sell value of your jokers to the left of it. And so, you know, previously, you know, some things that are kind of annoying about this. Um, one, the sell values of your jokers to the left, you know, not typically very much sell value. So not typically very much mult. I know it's a common joker and it's sort of unconditional in the sense that, um, you know, it doesn't care about what poker hand you play. It just gives you plus molt to all of your poker hands. It's worse than the current version right now is worse than abstract joker. And it's not just a little bit worse. It's way worse. You know, abstract joker gives you plus three molt for every joker, regardless of positioning. And sort of on average, jokers have a sell cost of three or, you know, all the commons have a sell cost of two. And so swashbuckler is very, very weak. Also, on top of that, there is this annoyance between, you know, we want to have our X mult jokers on the right side. Those are also typically your more valuable jokers, you know, the uncommons and the rares, they give you X mult. And so you want to be able to have the swashbuckler count those, but you can't because you have to put your X mult to the right. And so swashbuckler, you know, does very little in the early game when you don't have that many jokers, and it does not as much in the late game, you know, compared to other kind of plus mold options that you can have. So here's the change. Uh, it just adds the sell value of all of your jokers, uh, all other jokers. So it doesn't count itself. So it's a super teeny tiny buff here. The main difference is, oh, now I don't have to worry about where I position it, right? Um, which is a quality of life change. Not everyone was super into this mini game of trying to figure out, should I put the swashbuckler before or after my X molt? All right, the hanging Chad, um, it's one of these re-trigger jokers. Instead of re-triggering all of the cards in your hand, it just re-triggers the first card that gets played or the first card that gets scored. And so we've got Sock and Buskin, we've got Hack, we've got Seltzer, we've got Dusk. All of these uncommons re-trigger five cards. Every card gets re-triggered. The common version of that, Hanging Chad, is just the first one gets re-triggered. I know it's just a common, but you know those re-trigger jokers, those uncommon jokers are kind of already underpowered. Like in an average run, you know, we're not talking about like super high powered runs with like idol and like a bunch of, you know, red glass cards or whatever. Just in an average run. In an average run, Dusk is not super exciting. Sock and Buskin is not super exciting. And so already just those re-trigger jokers are not very powerful. And now you're taking it down to instead of five cards, just one card gets re-triggered. That sucks. Hanging Chad sucks. So what we're going to do instead now, instead of re-triggering the first card once, re-triggers it two times. That's it. That's the change. Uh, you get twice as many re-triggers to run the Hanging Chad. Um, I think that's really compelling. I think that's it's not going to be super powered. Um, but still, it's a common. I think this is the appropriate power level for a common. You know, if you have, let's say, you know, one of these jokers that gives you, you know, even Steven gives you plus four mult for an even card. Um, odd Todd gives you plus 30 chips for, you know, an odd card. Hanging Chad now gives you another 60 chips instead of before it was only giving you 30 chips. Hanging Chad now gives you plus eight mult instead of before it was giving you plus four mult. So that's huge. That's great you know, brings it more in line with the other common jokers by giving us this extra new effect. Kind of exciting. All right, uh, with the flower pot here, flower pot is going to include uh, debuffed cards. So previously, the flower pot said you have to score four different suits. And, you know, on one hand, like already, that's hard. Already, that sucks. You know, the same problem that I have with the ancient joker uh, the flower pot incentivizes you to play different suits, which maybe for some is a fun, interesting mini game, but it really is so obtuse. It's so different from what the rest of the game is screaming at you to do, screaming at you to homogenize your deck. And so you get to anti four or five and you p see a flower pot, you can't take it. it. It doesn't fit in. 
right? It's only when you get the flower pot early that you try to make it happen. And then it's just annoying to make it happen, right? Like there's, you have incentives for playing flushes, straight flushes, flush houses, like all same suit, that is a hand. Um, all different suit, that's not a poker hand, right? And so another thing on top of all of that, on top of what already sucks about the flower pot, all four of the suit bosses, they disable just one suit, they would disable your flower pot entirely. And so you have a very high chance of just running into that wall where now your flower pot is disabled, now you're not scoring enough, now you just lose, right? And so the, you know, was it like the blackboard joker that gives you times three multi when you have spades and clubs in hand, that doesn't care whether they're debuffed or not, they just have to be in your hand. And so flower pot is getting a change, now it includes debuffed cards, you know, whatever the base suit is. So like if it's, yeah, if it's a, a wild card that gets debuffed, it still counts whatever the base is. Those still count in determining whether or not it's going to trigger. So this is a quality of life change to the flower pot, okay? The flower pot is not going to get nerfed by all of those suit debuff bosses. So, you know, good for you, flower pot. You still suck. <laughs> uh, it's still very hard to make the flower pot happen. All right, uh, bootstraps is the one that gives you plus molt for however much money you have in the bank. Now the molt is included in the description. So uh, previously that was left out, now it's included. Great. Uh, the sinful jokers, those are the ones uh, you know, on page one of the collection, they give you plus molt for every suit. Um, so for example, greedy joker um, gives you diamonds. Uh, the lusty joker or lustful joker, I think it's lusty. I'm not sure why, I prefer Lustful probably. Anyway, um, it's uh, Hearts, and then so the the Glutinous Joker, that's the Clubs one, that one gives you uh, Clubs. All right, uh, the change is they give you plus three Molt now. So instead of plus four Molt, it's plus three. So this is a nerf. Um, I think this is deserved. I think this is earned here. Um, the, you know, it's way too easy to pick up one of these and just get plus 20 Molt really early right away, right? Um, it's not guaranteed that you get a flush. It's not guaranteed that you get a specific flush of a specific suit. And so, you know, there, the fail rate is non-zero, but it's pretty close to zero. It's pretty easy. It's pretty easy to get, you know, you just play the five cards and you're guaranteed 20 molt. And so, like, as a common joker, as, like, an early joker, um, this is maybe powerful enough that it can afford the nerf. Now it goes down to 15. You know, 15 molt for one common joker is still pretty good. Um, I think, you know, another kind of like metagame thing here is people are playing flushes way too much. And part of the reason why people are playing flushes so much is because of these, because of the sinful jokers. We have these common jokers. There are one for every suit. There are four of these. And so we have the crazy joker gives you plus molt for, um, sorry, gives you plus molt for straights. And then now the new mad joker gives you plus molt for, you know, containing two pair. Um, you know, could be full house, but containing two pair. You know, we have all of those uh, common jokers that care about certain poker hands, and we have four of these sinful jokers, right? So we have five times as many of the jokers that reward you for playing flushes. This is why people are playing flushes all the time. And so, you know, slight nerf here, I think, is deserved. And then also maybe, you know, pull people away from flushes into other, you know, perfectly viable builds as well, uh, full houses and straights. Now, you know, with the gold stake changes are going to be viable, perhaps even, you know, more so viable than flushes on these higher stakes with the higher scoring requirements. All right, we've also got here the banner gets a nerf. So instead of giving us 30 chips per discard, now going to be, or sorry, instead of 40 chips per discard, it's going to be 30 chips per discard. Yeah, I think that's reasonable. I think, uh, you know, it's currently the state of things is, you know, on the gold stakes, on the high stakes, you can win, you can't win with the higher ranking hands but you can win very easily with high card and pairs and stuff like that. And so, you know, what we want to do is we want to reduce access to these kind of like free chips, chips that don't care about what poker hand you're playing, these kind of like build independent chips. And so banner is one of those. You just get free chips no matter what hand you play. And so if you're just playing high card, just one card at a time, 
The thing that makes that possible, the thing that enables you to actually win with high card is you have a source of chips, right? It doesn't matter that uh, the high card, the base scaling, the Pluto cards are very weak, you know, very small numbers. If you're getting so many chips from your jokers, if you're getting so much molt from your ride the bus and your green joker and your erosion and, you know, from your jokers. And so, okay, banner, you deserve a nerf. Uh, it's, it's a common joker. At the end of the day, it's a common joker. And so for a common joker, giving us, you know, 60 or 30 chips, depending, or sorry, 60 or 90 chips, um, instead of 80 or 120, like 120 is huge, right? Like that's more chips than ice cream. And this doesn't decay where like the ice cream decays. I think this change brings banner closer in line with the blue joker, which I think the blue joker is in kind of a good place. So I'm excited about that change. Uh, Fibonacci here, Fibonacci superpower. If you, if, you, if you didn't already realize this, being able to get, you know, the same reason that these sinful jokers, you know, giving you plus 20 molt from the one common joker is like very powerful. Being able to get 40 molt from one joker, even if it is uncommon, even if it doesn't come up all that often, when it does come up, it slaps. Uh, and so it gives you the plus 40 molt and that plus 40 molt happens before any of your card effects. So you can pile on top of that. You can pile on top of that glass cards. You can pile on top of that. Um, you can, you know, get other X molt effects like the idol. You can get things like, uh, you know, steel cards on top of that. And so Fibonacci here is getting a slight nerf. Um, we're changing the $7 to the $8. So it just costs slightly more. Um, it's very powerful. So you just got to pay a little bit more, but you still get the same power. You just have to pay more. Um, the reasoning here, of course, Fibonacci, the one, three, five, eight sequence now will make the cost $8, uh, you know, because of the Fibonacci sequence. Sure, whatever, you know, this is cute, but really it, uh, it really needed a nerf. Um, the opposite direction that you can go, if Fibonacci is too powerful, we could just change the numbers, right? Like instead of giving you eight molt, maybe it gives you six molt. That sucks. <laughs> Uh, you know, we're not going to reduce the molt number because eight is, you know, that's the Fibonacci number. So we'll just raise the cost. We'll raise the cost $1. All right. For the next, we've got the steel joker here. All right. Steel joker gives you X molt per steel card in your deck. Um, this is just a slight nerf here. So instead of uh, 0.25 per, it's going to be 0.2 instead so you don't give you 20 percent less yeah i think that's fine i think uh you know the thing to note about the steel joker is it's unconditional in the sense that you know flower pot gives you x molt for a specific type of hand blackboard gives you uh, x molt for a specific type of hand card sharp gives you x molt some of the time um steel joker gives you x molt all of the time and so changing the number from 0.25 to 0.2, you know, reducing that number, um, I think is a good change. You know, if it's going to be on all of the time, um, then it needs to scale slower than it currently does. All right. The, you know, also with the Steel Joker, there's no drawback to adding more Steel cards to your deck. Like that's already its own reward, adding Steel cards to the deck. And so the Steel Joker giving you, you know, a huge x molt bonus on top of something that you're already doing is unnecessary it's egregious so we'll just lower the molt number a little bit on todd now 31 chips instead of 30 chips so slight buff there you're not going to feel the difference but it is cute now it gives you uh an odd number of chips though some people have pointed out you know if you start at an odd number and you add an odd number now the end result is you have an even number there's no winning you lose either way um, you know, before you add an even number and you end up with an odd number. Now, you know, at least on the card, when you read it, it says odd Todd is 31 chips. I think that's cute. The six cents here um, is now uncommon. So, you know, people will complain that previously the six cents was rare. That's the one where whenever you play a six as your first hand of the round, it deletes the six and it gives you a spectral card. And so like, you know, in theory, that's like kind of a cool, powerful effect, but in practice, it just wouldn't happen enough. Um, and so we're moving uh, six cents to uncommon. This does, by the way, this does make uh, spectral cards more accessible. 
and so you don't have to rely as much on the uh, what is it the spectral packs if you can get spectral cards from the sixth sense so that's like kind of a nice change there also now when you use the wraith to get a random rare or use a rare tag to get a random rare you can't get six cents anymore and so if you think about if you go through the list of all the different rare jokers okay which ones do you not want to hit six cents was one of them now you're not going to hit the six cents that's great that's cool um also the cost is uh changed now it's reduced because it's an uncommon cost six bucks for six cents that's kind of cute the hiker now is getting a buff, so plus five chips instead of plus four chips. Um, definitely the hiker needed a buff. The question is like how much of a buff does hiker need? Does it need to go to plus six chips or is plus five good enough instead of plus four? I think the thing that people kind of underestimate about hiker is it's really hard to pay attention to, you know, all of the numbers going up. Oh, this one has plus eight. This one has plus 12 or whatever. Um, it's really hard to see the impact because, you know, as you're going through and like drawing your cards and like selecting your hand, you can see on the left, the score preview tells you like what the base amount is. You could see at the top your other jokers, you know, already, even without massing over them, even without looking at them, you already remember what they're going to do. You already know Odd Todd is going to give me 150 chips here. You very rarely just look at how many chips your individual cards are giving. And, you know, most of the time it doesn't matter like all of the numbers are low enough that you know the cards that you play don't matter so it doesn't matter whether you play a full house with aces or if you play a full house with twos right what matters is the joker synergy that you have is the thing that actually matters and so you know as you're accumulating these plus chips from the hiker it's really hard to track and so you know i think you know, maybe people were underestimating the hiker before. I'm not saying that it didn't need a buff. I'm just saying that people were underestimating the hiker before. Um, and we'll maybe still continue to underestimate the hiker. But, okay, plus five chips is fine. I could see it going as high as plus six chips. Um, but, you know, maybe that's unnecessary. We'll try it at five and then, you know, see if we want to go to plus six after that. Uh, Gros Michelle, that's the uh, banana here. Banana is getting a change instead of uh, one in four chance to go extinct. Now it's going to be a one in six chance. You know, for some people, they're going to read this as, oh, that's a buff. You know, I get the banana. Now the banana is going to survive for longer. And so I can rely on it for my kind of early scoring. You know, for people who are struggling in the early game, you know, the extra buffoon pack guaranteed early on. Now the, uh, you know, banana is common, so you can rely on the banana for your early scoring. Um, that's going to be great. That's going to be a great buff there. For me, personally, this is a nerf. This is a nerf to the banana. We want the banana to go extinct. We want the banana to die on us because after the banana goes away, we could get the Cavendish. Cavendish shows up as a common joker and then gives us X molt unconditional x mult always x3 to any hand and so this one in four chance to one in six chance is a huge difference right one in four is 25 percent one in six is about you know 16 17 percent compared to 25 percent and so you know in terms of like expected value like expecting how long is the banana going to survive it's going to on average survive like two or three rounds more than it would before like that's a whole ante more than it was going to survive before it's going to be that much harder to get the banana and so you know maybe what i would be doing before is like i would pick up a banana in anti six because i would know that it's going to die fast enough i would know that i can find the cavendish fast enough even if i pick it up in anti six now you can't do that anymore um, and so, you know, this kind of, uh, advice of always bet on banana, maybe now we only bet on banana in the early game, but that's true about kind of all commons, right? So I get it. This makes sense. This change. It's just sad. It's just sad to see our, our boy done dirty like this. All right, next we've got Seance. Seance is another one of these uh, spectral card generators um, being changed to uncommon. You know, with the Sixth Sense and the Seance here, you know, on one hand, you know, getting spectral cards can be very powerful. There are a few that are very powerful, but most of the time it's just noise. Most of the time uh, they're skippable. They're not actually useful spectral cards. And so 
Sixth Sense and Seance going out all you know going out of your way so much to get these spectral cards, you didn't really get the payoff. You would get a random spectral card; it would be useless. You'd be sad. And so you know, I'm really glad that these are no longer rares. Um, Seance now being moved to uncommon. Also, the price decreased from seven to six because it's you know it's not a rare anymore. It doesn't need the rare price tag. We can, I mean, not. Not to say that we can't have an $8 uncommon like we do with Fibonacci's $8 as an uncommon, but I think $6 is reasonable for the seance. You know, given the expected value, what type of stuff that it can give you, I think it makes more sense that it is a lower powered, cheaper uncommon. Again, you know, removing this from the rare pool, if you generate a random rare, it's more likely to hit something that's going to be exciting uh riff raff was way too cheap riff raff was way too powerful you know you wouldn't ever take it in the late game in the late game the cost of jokers doesn't matter in the late game every joker might as well be 15 or 20 dollars because you really just are looking for a few very synergistic jokers right and so as you're re-rolling through the shop you just ignore most stuff you just skip most stuff it's just the one joker that you're looking for like the five jokers that you're looking for and so really what this cost change is affecting is the early game. And the way Riffraff currently works is you get Riffraff early. It generates, uh, you know, four other common jokers, right? You don't have to buy any other jokers. It just fills up your joker slots completely. You sell the ones that you don't want, picking up money, and it'll generate more to replace them. And so that's a huge head start more powerful than any other value generator at least like for the early game and so we're still allowing you to do that you can still do that you can still have your riffraff but now it's six dollars instead so you know in that first shop it's a little bit harder decision oh now instead of just four bucks i actually lose like a whole dollar of interest i potentially lose more than that am i willing to tank my entire early economy on the chance of just getting random jokers? The answer is yes. Uh, $6 is fine. All right, next we've got uh, the Vagabond here is being changed in a lot of different ways. Let's talk about Vagabond. So, you know, Vagabond, the, the premise, the promise is this, is you're not allowed to have above a certain amount of money because you're not allowed to have interest, right? If you have less than $3, then you end the round, you don't get any interest. And so you're playing at low level of economy. Your reward for that is instead of getting the money that you would normally get from interest, you get these tarot cards. Every time you play a hand, you get a tarot card. In practice, that's not actually how it works. In practice, Vagabond gives you the tarot cards. The tarot cards give you the gold cards. And so mid-round... You have low money because you spend down your money. But then at the end of the round, you get all the money from the gold cards. And then the interest calculation is after all of your gold cards are calculated. So you get to have both. You get to have interest and all of the tarot cards. And on top of that, Vagabond can give you things like Hermit and things like Temperance tarot cards. Fool to copy those. And so you can pop in a Temperance and just not use it right away. You can pop in a Hermit and not use it right away. After the round is over, after you get the money from all your gold cards, after you get all of your interest, then you can use the Hermit. And now you have $50 every shop. You end every shop with zero, but you start every, do every shop with $50. And that's, you know, that's like just the basic premise here. That's just, you know, uh, the managing your money. That's not the real power of the Vagabond. The real power of the Vagabond is using the tarot cards to manipulate your deck Hangman to remove cards from your deck, Death card to make copies of, you know, high value cards. Like if you get a seal from a standard pack, you can make copies of those red seals, copies of those um, purple seals if you want as well. And so basically in eight antes, right, in just like the standard non-endless mode, you can make your deck more than 70% all one card. You can completely homogenize your deck without even going into endless mode with just the Vagabond. And so what that means is, you know, regardless of whatever you were doing before, now Flush 5 is fully enabled from just the one Joker, right? Just the one Vagabond. That's all it took. And everything is fully online. You can make whatever deck you want. You can play whatever hand you want. You can get the perfect hand every time. And so, okay, what is the, how do we fix this, right? Obviously, Vagabond is too powerful to be an uncommon. 
So we're going to change it to rare. So you still get the game warping deck manipulation that Vagabond was already providing. It's just going to happen less often. Now it's going to happen at rare instead of uncommon, right? You know, if we compare this to Cardomancer is an uncommon, gives you one tarot card per round. Vagabond gives you, you know, three or four tarot cards, gives you more tarot cards with some, you know, hoops that you have to jump through. And so, you know, the upside is higher. And then that's why it's a rare. Also, the cost goes up. So, you know, before $6 is not that expensive. So you can kind of buy it even if you have not that much money. And then, you know, just get the thing rolling here. Whereas like Vagabond now costing $8 as a rare, you do have to have, you know, a little bit more economy, a little bit more security online first before you can afford that first Vagabond, that Vagabond that's going to generate a ton of value for you. You need some money to start the investment here. Um, also, slight buff here. We've got uh, the previously you had to have three or less dollars. Now it's going to change to four or less dollars. And so it was in the demo season. It was four or less dollars. And then we changed it. We changed it to three or less dollars because we said, oh, OK, OK, OK. You know, four or less dollars is too easy to do. And so if we change it to three or less dollars, it'll be a little bit harder for you to get below three dollars. So it'll be a little bit harder to get the Vagabond online. You're going to get less value from your Vagabond. Like that was the theory. Turns out that's uh, that's not actually how it works. You can always get down below three dollars. It just takes more planning. It just takes more thinking. It's not that you can't do it anymore. It's just like you have to think harder to make it happen. But then you can still do it. If you carefully plan in the shop stuff that you're buying and selling, you know, how many rerolls you want to do, how many booster packs you want to buy, you can get down below $3. You can get down below $2 every time if you want. So we're going to revert this. We're going to change it back to the four or less instead of the three or less. This doesn't change the value of the Vagabond. This doesn't change the utility of the Vagabond. The Vagabond is still giving you the same utility as before. It's just less annoying. So I think this is a great quality of life change. This is deserved. I think the um, the change from the four or less to the three or less was like a bad n nerf. I think that was not the right way to nerf it. And then so now we're just reverting that change. We're just going to make it rare. You still get all the power of the Vagabond. You just get it less often in your runs. Uh, Minor changes here. So Cloud9 cost goes up. Um, you know, Golden Joker was $6, gives you $4 per round. Cloud9 starts at $4 per round. And so Cloud9, you know, has higher upside. You have more nines in your deck. You get more money from your Cloud9. And so, okay, we'll make Cloud9 cost more than the Golden Joker. Like, that makes sense, right? It should cost more than Golden Joker. Um, we've got mail-in rebate here. Uh, the cost is going down or sorry um this is a little bit misleading here this should be instead of the cost changing the payout is changing i believe is that true i don't know how to read this right rebate is i think rebate is very powerful i think uh it's like pretty easy to just like discard whatever cards and like get it online and get a lot of money per round um, so I'm hoping what this is, like I said, I don't know how to read this, but what I'm hoping that this says is the payout, the payout, instead of giving you, um, $5 per card discarded changes to $3 per card discarded or wait, is that how it already is? Sorry. Let me, let me think about that. Uh, the faceless joker gives you five bucks rebate. Wait, rebate already gives you three bucks. Okay. Um, yeah, rebate is being made cheaper now, $3 instead of $5. That seems like a mistake. Wait, 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 wait. sorry. I just, I just read this completely wrong. Rebate previously cost $3 now pays at now $5. Is that the payout or is that the cost? Like does rebate cost five bucks now? I don't know how to evaluate this. Um, I think rebate, I don't know. I don't know how to evaluate that. All right. Uh, the reserved parking here was uncommon, now common. So, you know, we have all of these other, you know, common money generating jokers, like the rebate, like the to-do list. Uh, the reserved parking is now common. 
you know, to match all of those other money generators, I think that's fine. I think, you know, the reserve parking, there was a version in the past that didn't have the one in two chance. There was a version in the past that instead of giving you $1 per card, gave you $2 per card. There were past versions of the parking that were just like too powerful. And that's like how it became uncommon before it was nerfed. And then now that it's been nerfed, um, I think common is completely reasonable. I like, you know, the consistency of having all of the money generators at common or at least most of the money generators at common with a few exceptions like cloud nine which is kind of a special one being an uncommon uh lucky cat is going to grow faster now so you know times 2.5 instead of times two this is a very very tiny change you're not really going to feel this change the main change that you're going to feel is uh, the lucky cards or sorry the magician now gives you two lucky cards at a time And so getting two lucky cards at a time this lucky cat is going to grow faster because you just have more lucky cards um, I think that's cool um, because I really love the lucky cat um, I love the mechanic, you know, I just want the You know the scaling to match right to be worthwhile uh, the trading card here the cost is six dollars instead of five dollars trading card is incredibly powerful i've i've demonstrated this in my videos again you know very similar to the vagabond this kind of like deck sculpting ability deck warping ability to remove cards from your deck and then you know you get to the final ante and you, you've only got you know 28 cards in your deck you could get the perfect hand you can use all your discards and you can find whatever hand that you're looking for specific you know not just oh i need to find a straight flush but i can find a specific straight flush i can find a specific set of five glass cards or you know whatever it is on top of the card removing ability trading card also gives you money right trading card gives you two benefits which is huge and so slight nerf here um it costs more now six bucks instead of five bucks you know more in line with the uh you know golden joker golden joker costs six bucks and so trading card should cost at least as much as golden joker uh campfire nerf huge nerf here um is now uh half the scaling and so instead of times uh 0.5 for each card sold is now going to be 0.25 um yeah i think this is completely reasonable you know very consistently very easily without buying and selling cards to specifically feed the campfire just sort of like in my normal play pattern you know using you know cards that generate tarot cards you know holding on to buying and selling planet cards i would routine routinely get campfire up to you know like times five every round for free without doing anything weird um you know get it up to times five um so now instead of being times five it'll be a times three right um and then now you know if you do go super hard if you do spend extra money to scale this thing instead of being like a times nine it'll be like a times five instead and i think that's completely reasonable i think um campfire because you could grow it so easily in like the last two antes the last two rounds it really trivializes makes the boss way too easy so happy to see campfire get the nerf there uh smiley face here getting a buff so you know the sinful jokers instead of plus four molt now plus three molt for every card of a certain suit smiley face now plus five molt for every face card instead of plus four molt um this was not something that i was pushing for you know this is not something that i you know i needed to happen but i'm not mad about this um smiley face is going to keep its five dollar price tag here to make up for the plus five molt here you know the thing about the you know different suit jokers compared to the smiley face it's easy to put a bunch of suits in the same hand right it's easy to just generically make flushes uh for smiley face here in order to put a lot of face cards in the same hand you really limited to full houses which are kind of hard in general and full houses with face cards specifically is then you know even more difficult and so probably the easiest scenario is you play two pair, you play two pair, you get 20 molt um, versus, you know, maybe you play a straight or maybe you play a flush and maybe, you know, those give you like 15 and 10 molt respectively. So, you know, it's, it's just hard. It's hard to jam a lot of face cards into one hand. And so being able to get a bigger payout per face card, um, I think is a good change. Uh, golden ticket here. 
you know, something that was slightly awkward about the golden ticket before is, you know, it gives you money when you play gold cards instead of holding the gold cards. So it kind of changes the way that the gold cards function, right? Except, you know, you get the same amount of money whether you play or whether you hold the gold cards. And when you have a small number of gold cards, this doesn't do anything, right? If it's just $3. And if you have a large number of gold cards, that's when it starts to help. That's when it starts to take over where you draw a whole hand full of gold. You play some to score and you hold some to earn, right? Rather than holding on to all of them. Um, or, you know, now there's synergy with, uh, you know, the retrigger jokers like Dusk, Sock and Buskin, Hack, where you can retrigger all of your gold cards. And so it's worth more to play them instead of hold them. But that's like in this very specific scenario where you do have these retrigger jokers. So as like a baseline here, the incentive to get, you know, $4 per card instead of $3 per card, holding it gives you $3, playing it gives you $4. Um, I think that's a great incentive. Golden Ticket actually does something now rather than doing nothing. Uh, Bloodstone, instead of being a 1 in 3 chance, is now a 1 in 2 chance. Um, it's still going to be the times 2, it just happens more often. Um, Bloodstone, I don't think that this change was needed necessarily, right? So, you know, 1 in 3 on average is still times 4, with, you know, most of the time it giving you at least times 2. And so, you know, the, the, the situation people would complain about the Bloodstone is if you were relying on it too much. And if you were relying on it too much, then if it whiffs on you, then it is kind of disappointing. It's kind of upsetting. Um, whereas, like, you know, you play your flush, and if it doesn't, you know, get all the times twos and it doesn't score, you just play another flush, right? You just play a second flush. Like you, how, are, how are you not able to play two flushes with hearts, right? So I don't think that this buff was needed, but... You know, I don't think anyone's going to complain about it either. Um, the, you know, the one in two chance compared to one in three chance is actually like a pretty big difference and now makes Bloodstone, you know, very powerful, very viable. You know, in my opinion, actually more powerful than the, you know, let's say the Ancient Joker, right? Because Ancient Joker gives you times 1.5 for every card. Two times 1.5s is a times 2.25. Right, and a times 2.25, that's close enough to a times two. And so, you know, the Bloodstone says, okay, if you play two cards, then on average, that's going to be a times two. So Bloodstone is similar power level to the Ancient Joker, the Ancient Joker being this rare Joker. And so, I don't know, I think this is overkill. I think this is too much. Um, I would like to see, you know, maybe a cost increase for the Bloodstone to match with this. Okay, if you want to buff the, the proc chance here to 1 and 2 instead of 1 and 3, make it cost more also. Or reduce the payout instead of times 2, maybe times 1.75 or something like that. Um, Onyx Agate uh, is very similar to Fibonacci where, you know, just getting 40 molt from the one Joker is like way too powerful. Onyx Agate more powerful than Fibonacci because Onyx Agate, you, it's more, it's easier to play five clubs than it is to play, you know, Fibonacci cards. Um, the easiest way to get the Fibonacci cards is to play the low straight, ace through five straight. You get four cards in there or you could play a full house. Um, with the agate, it's just easier to get a club's flush. And so instead of having it plus eight molt, now it's plus seven molt per card. You know, previously I said for the Fibonacci, I think uh, a way to nerf Fibonacci would be to r reduce the payout. Instead of giving you eight molt, give you plus seven molt or give you plus six molt or something like that. But of course, you know, then it wouldn't be as thematic if it didn't give you plus eight. So Fibonacci, okay, it has to stay as plus eight. Agate can get the axe here. Agate can go down to plus seven per card instead of plus eight. Um, it is, by the way, it is an uncommon joker. So for uncommons, they are allowed to be a little bit more powerful. You know, compare Onyx Agate to the pants, you know, which is better, Agate or the pants? Well, it depends on at what point in the game you are in, right? And I think that's the best answer. The best answer is, well, it depends. All right, Glass Joker now just grows faster. Okay, yeah, I mean, uh, I wasn't using the Glass Joker a whole lot. You know, the thing that's like kind of awkward about the Glass Joker is, 
when I get glass cards, I get them to break them on purpose most of the time. Like I'm just going for the deck manipulation, unless I'm going for like some specific challenge where I actually need the extra scoring. And then what I'll do is I'll create glass cards for the purpose of saving them to the final hand. So I just always discard them until I get to the final round and then I use them for the first and last time. And so the glass joker gives you permission to play your glass cards, but it does it in kind of a terrible way. Like you get way more value if you just get the X molt from playing the glass cards than if you get from, you know, leveling up the glass joker. Glass joker doesn't start leveling up until after you buy it and you hold on to it. So it's going to start out doing nothing. And then when you lose your glass cards, then that's when it starts to grow. And so maybe the best case scenario is you need the glass cards to survive in the mid game. And then after you've played the glass cards, after you've ex exhausted them, then you can play the glass or you can use the glass joker later. I think it's just way worse than the cat. I think it's worse than the, um, you know, the steel joker. Um, I think the glass joker could deserve even more of a buff than this. I think just the way that it plays is awkward. And so maybe, you know, even changing the number is not enough. Maybe it just needs a complete rework. Stuntman here, you know, that's the one that gives you a bunch of chips, but then gives you minus two hand size. And so instead of giving you 300 chips, now 250 chips, absolutely deserved. Um, so this is one where as soon as you get the stuntman, you could just play high card. That's it. Forget everything else that you're doing. Now you can go brain off. And um, I think that's sad. I think that's terrible design. And so I'm happy to see the number come down here. I mean, you could still do your high card thing. Um, it's just a little bit higher or a little bit harder to win with just high cards or just the one stuntman. You're going to need more than just stuntman in order to carry your high card build. And I think that's great design. I think that's great for the, you know, diversity. All right, the uh, Invisible Joker here now requiring only two rounds instead of three rounds. Cost coming down as well instead of $10 and now $8. Um, I think these are both great changes here. You know, let's you know address the elephant in the room. Invisible Joker is just worse than Blueprint, right? It's just worse than Brainstorm. Blueprint gives you a copy of another Joker, but it's flexible. You can keep changing your mind about what that copy is. And so it's dynamic. You know, Blueprint acts as three or four different jokers over the course of a round as you keep moving it around, as you keep changing what it's copying. Invisible Joker gives you a copy of exactly one card. So definitely it's not worth 10 bucks. It's definitely not worth the same amount as Blueprint and Brainstorm. So $8, fine, if we want to reduce the cost. And then also holding on to it for three rounds is kind of tough. You know, if you if it just doesn't do anything for those three rounds, and so reducing it to two rounds is totally fine um definitely you know if it were one round that would be too short if you could just use it right away you know kind of like the um the cola you just buy it and sell it um you know it would just be the same as an onk right the onk giving you a copy of a random joker so requiring at least two rounds i think is still correct um reducing the cost to eight dollars but maybe not less than that like of course Okay, Blueprint is overpowered. Blueprint costs $10, but Blueprint is probably worth like $20. It doesn't cost $20, but it's worth $20. And so seeing this as, okay, $8 is only a little bit less than $10. Actually, $8 is way less than $20, right? And so Invisible Joker, yeah, it's, it's in a fine place. Um, I think this is the appropriate level for a rare, whereas like Blueprint is like way off the charts. And so don't use Blueprint as like, the benchmark as like the point of comparison. Burn Joker is now rare, of course. Uh, you know, being able to guarantee you one level every round is incredible scaling, better scaling than you get from any scaling Joker. You know, Spaceman gives you an upgrade one in four times. This gives you an upgrade every time. And so kind of the dumb thing that you can do with this is you can discard high card and you can discard a pair and then level those up incredibly fast you know this is way better than you know even the telescope telescope gives you you know whatever your most played hand is in the celestial packs except it requires the celestial packs to show up if you don't get celestial packs then you don't get any telescope value whereas like burnt joker is always always gives you this value and so seeing this upgraded to rare i think is super deserved 
Um, you know, even on the upper end, you know, if you're not playing high card in pairs, if you have like a long endless run and you get the deck manipulation from, you know, the trading card or from the Vagabond, um, you can get like a flush every hand, upgrade flush every hand. You can get flush five in your opener hand. Um, discard flush five, get upgrade flush five every round. Like that's huge. That's that's way too much. Um, I think B Burn Joker is a fun design. I think it's fun. This uh, mechanic of you have to discard a hand in order to level it up. Um, I just want to see it at rare instead of uncommon, so that it'll be less dominating. Also, then for people who don't like the Burnt Joker, don't want to see the Burnt Joker come up. Now the burn joker is going to show up less often. So like for me, you know, a lot of times I'm doing something that's not compatible with the burn joker. Like I'm not doing the high card nonsense. And so I see the burn joker in the shop. I'm like, oh, I can't really do this. I can't really fit it into my build. You know, now it's going to show up less often. So I think that's cool too. Um, and for, you know, we've got some wording changes here on all of the scaling jokers. You know, it kind of bothered me that all of the scaling jokers had wildly different references, wildly different wording. And so now, um, theoretically, I haven't read through all of the changes, but, you know, we'll see. You know, they're going to be more consistent wording, referencing themselves as this joker as the thing that is growing. Um, let's see here. We've got some booster packs here or some bug fixes here. So one of these is if you're in a booster pack and you have a hand size of zero, then, you know, certain cards, you know, let's say you're in a, um, so Arcana pack, right? Certain cards are, you can't use them. And if you can't use any cards, when you have zero hand size, you actually can't skip an Arcana pack. And so you would just be stuck. You would be you would be locked. Um, this is now fixed, or at least allegedly it'll be fixed, um, where booster packs are always skippable, even if you have hand size zero. Um, and the cards generated by certificate, I guess were not debuffed by the boss. That's kind of weird. Like if you have a suit debuff boss, then um, you know if it generates a hearts card, then it wouldn't be debuffed. I don't use super certificate that much, and so I didn't, you know, really interact with that. So sure, whatever. Um, you know, the certificate, the way that I feel about it, if you hold on to it for a short period of time, if you use it to give you just a couple cards, you know, adding cards to the deck is dangerous, right? You don't want to add too many cards to the deck. But if you add a couple high value cards to the deck, as long as it's only a couple, then it's worth it. And so what the way that I like to play the certificate, if I ever play the certificate, is use it to generate two cards, two seals, and then sell it. Um, two for me feels like about the right number. Maybe you could push it to three, but maybe now, you know, with the blue seal change, blue seal is better, and so maybe certificate is better. Does that mean that certificate is too good now? I don't know, we'll have to see. I have to check on this rebate thing. I have to think about this. You know, uh, this doesn't say the cost has changed, so I think this means the payout changed. The payout changed from previously was $3, right? That makes sense. It was to-do list gave you $5, faceless joker gave you $5, rebate gave you $3 per card. Now it's $5 per card. That seems a lot, maybe. That seems too much. Like we've demonstrated in the past, you know, once you start homogenizing your deck, once you get a bunch of the same card, you discard five of the same card, you get 25 bucks. You discard three times, you get 75 bucks. And that's not counting, you know, if you got Blueprint or Brainstorm giving you copies of the rebate. That seems like too much. Anyway, these are my thoughts. All of my thoughts on the new patch here. Um, once again, you know, if you want to try it out for yourself, if you want to play test, go to the Steam library. Um, properties, betas, and you want to select the public experimental. All right, good luck. Take care, everyone.